before you start talking. I know it's up. Okay. So, or else they won't hear Good morning. I would like to call the uh, Subcommittee on Federal Workforce, U.S. Postal Service and Labor, Labor Policy to order. And today we've got uh, uh, the topic of our hearing is Honoring George Washington's Legacy, Does America Need a Reminder? And uh, before we begin our hearing, I will uh, uh, state our, our committee and subcommittee's um, mission statement. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tireless, tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. And I'll begin with my opening statement. Today we will hear from a panel of witnesses, including Congressman Wolf, to discuss the merits of reestablishing February 22nd as the federal holiday commemorating George Washington's birthday. On February 22nd, 1732, in Westmoreland County, Virginia, our nation's first president, George Washington, was born. In 1885, Congress enacted legislation declaring that Washington's birthday be observed by all federal employees on February 22nd of each year. For 83 years, Americans honored President Washington on his birthday until Congress passed the Uniform Monday Holiday Act in June of 1968. This legislation moved the legal public holiday for the observance of George Washington's birthday to the third Monday in February. In 2011, Representative Frank Wolf of Virginia introduced H.R. 2268, a bill to change the official federal observance of George Washington's birthday back to February 22nd each year. I thank the witnesses for being here today, and I look forward to your testimony. I now recognize the distinguished gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing today. I want to welcome um, uh, some old friends um, here to the Congress, um, especially uh, especially those who uh, represent Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon uh, has such a, a devoted group of people 
uh, who promote its cause and its history and that of our founding father and, uh, and his wonderful wife, I might add, as well. So thank you so much for being here today. I want to thank particularly my colleague, uh, Frank Wolf, for joining us uh, and for his sponsorship of legislation to commemorate George Washington's birthday in a historically accurate manner. American Revolutionary Cavalryman and Virginia Governor Henry Lighthouse Horse Harry Lee eulogized George Washington as first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his fellow countrymen. George Washington was also one of our nation's first federal employees. At a time when denigration of public service is in vogue, it's appropriate for us to honor our nation's most famous federal employee, who, like so many other federal employees, served in both military and civilian capacities. I appreciate Lucia Henderson appearing on behalf of Mount Vernon Estate, managed by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. Mount Vernon's director, Jim Reese, is retiring after 29 years of service. And all of us uh, who know Jim honor the wonderful work he's done. He's not able to attend this hearing today, uh, but those of us in Northern Virginia appreciate his service to the community and his sound stewardship of Mount Vernon for almost three decades. The Mount Vernon Ladies Association has managed and has protected Mount Vernon since 1853 and is open every day of the year for public visitation. The staff and volunteers of Mount Vernon deserve a great deal of credit for protecting this national treasure for the last 158 years and for their work to educate Americans about George Washington. Congressman Wolf has noted that we can do our small part to honor George Washington by celebrating his birthday on the day it occurred, February 22nd. For the sake of expediency, Congress began celebrating President's Day on the third Monday in February in 1968. Uh, it is possible and desirable to continue honoring President's Day while also commemorating Washington's birthday on his birthday, February 22nd. I appreciate Mr. Wolf's work on legislation to reestablish that date as Washington's birthday and as a legal public holiday occurring on that date. And I've, I've been proud to co-sponsor his bill. As Mr. Wolf has noted when he introduced the bill, less than a quarter of American students earned proficient scores on the nation's report card in 2010. The lessons students should be learning about George Washington are central to our identity as a democracy, and they include his voluntary abdication of power after two terms as our president, and his conscious separation of the military from the federal executive and legislature. His chairmanship of the Constitutional Convention in 1787 ensured that our nation could create the strong, strong central government it needed in place of the weaker Articles of Confederation. Again, thank you, Congressman Wolf, for your leadership and your work to recognize Washington's birthday, and I very much look forward to the testimony today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, members may have seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous materials for the record. And we will now welcome our first panel of witnesses. Uh, our first witness is the Honorable Frank Wolf from Virginia, 10th Congressional District, and who is the sponsor of H.R. 2268, a bill which would move the official Federal observance of George Washington's birthday holiday to George Washington's actual birthday, February 22nd. Our other second witness is um, Mr. Richard Brookheiser, who is the author of Founding Father, Rediscovering George Washington, as well as the author of seven other books on early American history. Uh, he was awarded the National Humanities Medal in 2008. Our third panelist is Ms. Ann D. Neal, who is the President of American Council of Trustees and Alumni, and as I understand it, also probably the better half of one of our colleagues, Congressman Mr. Petri. Um, and then finally, we have uh, our fourth panelist, Ms. L Lucia Henderson, who is the Vice Regent representing the District of Columbia on the Mount Vernon Ladies Association Board of Regents. This association owns and maintains George Washington's Mount Vernon estate. Uh, I will uh, ask each uh, member or panelist to uh, limit their discussion to five minutes, uh, as your entire written testimony, of course, has been made part of the record today. Um, with that, I uh, now recognize. Uh, uh, Mr. Wolf. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for having the hearing. I also want to thank Mr. Mr. Connolly, and I also want to thank your staff be, for being very, very helpful. And I also want to re remember Jim Reeves, who has uh, uh, done so much with regard to Mount Vernon and, and George Washington. I will summarize by saying, does anyone here today celebrate their birthday on the third month, Monday of a month? And of course not. And I think we diminish uh, uh, George Washington by by doing this. I saw an ad the other day where two guys are dancing at a furniture store uh, in honoring of a furniture sale 
uh, it was Value City Furniture, I think it was, for George Washington. And when I think of what George Washington has done, Tutan Bolter Prize winner, historian David McCullough, who supports this legislation, and every scholar that we've written in the country, every single one, uh, has supported this legislation. He said, we're raising the young people who are, by and large, historically illiterate. I believe Congress, back in 1968, unwittingly contributed to, uh, to uh, this uh, idea. In the summer of 1775, George Washington was chosen by Congress to lead the Continental Army. And all you have to do is go up uh, to, to Trenton, where he crossed the Delaware. It's a powerful spot, and think of what he, he, he did. In a letter supporting the legislation, uh, Richard Brookhiser said, quote, George Washington held unprecedented power and responsibility, military, political, and a brand new nation without breaking or bending its laws. He did every job he was asked, and when he was done, he went, he went home. Uh, his character is exemplary. We, uh, we know uh, he had to support both Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton, and they didn't agree on very, very much. But they did agree of the greatness of George Washington. In 1789, there was only the blueprint of the Constitution. There's so much talk of the Constitution by Congress and the federal government had to create its own tra traditions. Author Myron Magnate, in his letter, supported this legislation, said, quote, there was so much Washington had to make up as he went along, out of his own judgment, experience, instinct, and he had to bring his audience along with him by force of character. America has really uh, benefited by that. And by, I'll end by reading from David McCullough as I close. In his letter of supporting the bill, David McCullough said, quote, celebrating George Washington's birthday on February 22nd, is a simple, solid, self-evident statement of respect for one of the greatest of all Americans, for his life, whole, his whole founding generation, and for so much that we owe them. And with that, I yield back and thank you for having the hearing. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, could I just ask that if uh, Congressman Wolf has letters such as the one he read that he'd like to enter into the record, I'd, I'd ask with your consent uh, that uh, they be entered into the record and that we keep record open for additional uh, letters of uh, commendation. Great. We will submit yeah, without objection. all those. Uh, thank you, Mr. Connolly. Thank you. Our next witness, Mr. Brookheiser, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for having us. I, I want to second uh, Congressman Wolf's praise of Jim Reese. Uh, he's done a great job for a long, long time. Um, Washington had a very busy life. Uh, he was Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army from the summer of 1775 through December of 1783. The Revolution was our longest war until Vietnam. It was longer than the Civil War and World War II put together, and he was the Commander-in-Chief through almost all of it. In 1787, he presides over the Constitutional Convention, and then in 1789, he is elected as first president and reelected. Uh, Washington's presidential campaigns were very simple affairs. All he had to do to win was to not say he wouldn't serve. I understand it's gotten harder uh, since then. <laughs> and then his last and one, one of his most important services is to go home. And he does it twice. Uh, during the war, George III was having his portrait painted by Benjamin West, who was an American painter who would moved to England. And the king asked West, what did he think General Washington would do at the end of the war? And West said, uh, well, your majesty, I believe he'll go home to his farm. And the king said, if he does that, he's the greatest man now living. And he did it twice after the war and again after his presidency. But I just want to talk a little bit now about one story from the war, because it's a story about leadership. It's also a story about history. And this has to do with the aftermath of the Battle of Trenton. Trenton was the day after Christmas, 1776. It was a victory, but it came after six months of crushing defeats. It saved the cause. But Washington knew the British would strike back. So in the new year, he puts his main army outside Trenton to the south across a creek. He knows the British are going to come down from the north. And he has some troops guarding the road and the town. And their orders are to execute a fighting retreat and to cross the only bridge across the creek and rejoin the main army. 
And we know what happened because of a private, John Howland. He was a teenager from Rhode Island, and he wrote this up years later when he was an old man. Uh, the British come into town 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Nightfall is quarter to 5. So muskets are flashing in the dusk. And Howland says, the bridge was narrow, and our platoons in passing it were crowded into a dense and solid mass, in the rear of which the enemy were making their best efforts. Now, Holland doesn't say anything about fear, but these words, narrow, crowded, dense, show that this is a real option at this moment. Then on the far side of the creek, he sees Washington on horseback. Washington was watching the retreat. But Howland is watching him. The firm, composed, and majestic countenance of the general inspired confidence. Then almost at the moment of safety, there's a closer contact. At the end of the bridge, I pressed against the shoulder of the general's horse and in contact with the boot of the general. The horse stood as firm as the rider and seemed to understand that he was not to quit his post and station. Now, Howland is describing the horse, but he's also describing himself. The British Army is at his back, but General Washington is there so Private Howland can do what he has to do. Now, Woody Allen uh, famously said that 80% of celebrity is just showing up, but 100% of leadership is showing up at the right time in the right place and doing the right thing. And then if you fail, you show up again and again and again until you succeed. And what Washington and Howland went on to do, they marched all night and they fought and won the Battle of Princeton the next day. But, but the Howland story is also about history. It's about how history works. We can talk in abstractions. We can talk about trends and principles. We can talk about presidents. We can talk about President's Day. But history is the story of people. And the story of John Howland and George Washington is one person inspiring another. And when we feel the touch of Howland up against the boot and the horse, the story reaches out over 230 years and touches us. That's how history inspires us. It's how it encourages us. It's how, it's, it's how it helps us. So help George Washington help America. Give him back his birthday. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brookhiser. Uh, Ms. Neal, you're now recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I cannot tell a lie. Too many Americans, particularly our youngest ones, are suffering from a severe case of historical amnesia. Do Americans need a reminder about George Washington and American history in general? The answer is an emphatic yes. There was a time in the past when we did celebrate George Washington's birthday, but now it is engulfed in a meaningless President's Day, more focused on mattress discounts and car sales than the great heroes of our past. Restoring the official celebration to Washington's real birthday, February 22nd, would be a great place to start. Our founding fathers and presidents have consistently recognized the importance of knowing our history. History is the means by which a nation establishes its sense of identity and purpose, said John F. Kennedy. And Ronald Reagan, in his last address from the Oval Office, said, let's start with some basics, more attention to American history, and a greater emphasis on civic ritual. Distinguished scholars agree. University of Chicago professor Amy Cass has suggested the creation of an American calendar to enhance American civic education by noting individuals and events that have defined the nation. As you've heard, historians David McCullough, Gordon Wood, and my fine fellow panelist Richard Brookheiser feel much the same. And these scholars are not alarmists. Their concerns are unfortunately supported by unrelenting evidence of growing historical amnesia. Let me give you just two examples. In a 1998 survey by the National Constitution Center, more teenagers could name the three stooges than could name the three branches of government. And as Representative Wolf said, the most recent national report card on history issued by the Education Department in 2010 finds that more than half of high school seniors are below basic when it comes to history knowledge and understanding. 
regrettably the situation in our american colleges and universities is equally bad the american council of trustees and alumni has done a survey of over a thousand colleges across the country and our findings were alarming in george washington's home state virginia only two universities james madison and regent require students to study american history or government nationwide not one leading university expects its students to take a survey of american history or government before they graduate now i'll admit we most of us assume that college graduates have a basic understanding of the country's history and founding principles but we would be wrong when we commissioned the roper survey of the seniors what did we find even amongst highly selective colleges seniors could not identify the father of the constitution the battle of the bulge nor the general at yorktown by contrast nearly 100 percent could identify the rapper snoop dogg and cartoon characters beavis and butthead but let's be clear this is not just about memorizing facts this is about the obligation of americans to be informed citizens knowledgeable about their history and heritage since our democratic republic demands it on this subject there is no one better than george washington himself a primary object he said should be the education of our youth in the science of government in a republic what species of knowledge can be equally important and what duty more pressing than communicating it to those who are to be the future guardians of the liberties of the country to live day to day without a solid connection to our government and our history leaves us poorly prepared to be guardians of the liberties that George Washington fought so hard to win for us all. It's definitely time for our educational institutions to get their priorities straight. But restoring America's memory is not simply the task of our schools and universities. The current disconnect between America's founding heroes and the American people is only going to grow wider and more difficult to change unless a concerted effort on all fronts is to made to reverse this trend that is why hr 2268 is so important unlike other countries we in the united states are not tied together by race religion or ethnicity we are bound together by ideas and the men and women behind those ideas a shared memory gives us all a common foundation a common bond that in this day of frequent bickering and divisiveness, we surely need more than ever. George Washington is no mere president to be jumbled with Millard Fillmore and Chester A. Arthur. He's the standard bearer, the precedent setter. He is, to use the words of historian James Flexner, the indispensable man. By marking George Washington's birthday on his real day, Congress can underscore the importance of knowing our history and its heroes. It can rightfully single out our first president for his unmatched courage, leadership, and character. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Neal. Ms. Henderson, you are now recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, thank you for considering how we might invigorate the memory of our first president in the hearts and minds of all Americans. As the Vice Regent for the District of Columbia, of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, I want you to know how strongly we support making the nation's official observance of George Washington's birthday on his actual birth date of February 22nd. This change would hopefully restore the birthday to a patriotic celebration of the father of our country and avoid it being trivialized as a three-day commercial shopping extravaganza. The Mount Vernon Ladies Association saved George Washington's home from potential ruin, maintains this priceless national landmark for the good of the American people, and has worked tirelessly over more than 150 years to keep this extraordinary legacy alive. And we have accomplished this solely through private donations, as we do not accept government funds. George Washington was the most important, the most effective, the most powerful leader of our nation's founding era. Many today have drifted so far from his standards of leadership and character that it is a real cause for concern. It is our duty, our responsibility, and our privilege to teach today's leaders and young people about George Washington's leadership with the hope that they will follow in his footsteps. 
President Abraham Lincoln would remind friends that his favorite book as a boy was a biography of George Washington, and he said, quote, George Washington is the mightiest name on earth. To add brightness to the sun or glory to the name of Washington is alike impossible. Let none attempt it, close quote. The more than one million visitors who come to Mount Vernon each year learn about our first president by seeing the home where he lived, worked, and died. In our orientation center, education center, and museum, all of which just opened just five years ago, we explain how the actions of this great and good man changed the world, giving all of us the freedoms we enjoy through democratic government. In addition, Mount Vernon's educational outreach goes well beyond the visitors who enter the gates of the estate. Our instructive programming includes a wide array of free resources offered nationwide to support both educators and students. But despite our best efforts, we are still reaching only a very small group of Americans. And today, what should be a celebration to honor our first president's birthday has evolved into a commercial holiday, which does not teach or inspire. Shoppers benefit while the sense of pride in our American heritage and, and patriotism is diluted. For all practical purposes, George Washington's birthday celebration has been abandoned. Many of us grew up with portraits of our first president in each classroom. At the time of George Washington's birthday, our teachers would develop special projects that taught lessons about the long struggle to win independence from the strongest military power of its time. Through these lessons, we learned to appreciate the sacrifices other made, others made for the liberty and freedom we all enjoy today. We were inspired by the example of George Washington, who was the indispensable man through the eight long years of the War for Independence as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army, through the Constitutional Convention where he was elected unanimously as his president, and through his two terms as our new nation's first president, where again he was elected unanimously, not once, but twice. What were the qualities that made him so great? Americans of all ages should be thinking about this question, and as they learn what these qualities are, let's hope they will learn to value them and incorporate them into their lives. Let's give Americans these learning opportunities every year as we celebrate George Washington's birthday on February 22nd. One of the most distinguishing qualities of Washington was his willingness to sacrifice the life he loved at Mount Vernon when he was called to serve his country. More than anyone in American history, he understood and valued patriotic duty. Another admirable trait was his willingness to give up power as the commander of the Continental Army and again after his second term as president. Our association is currently building the National Library for the Study of George Washington at Mount Vernon, which will open in the fall of 2013. It will eventually hold Washington's personal library and related books and manuscripts. It will offer fellowship opportunities for scholars. All of our educational outreach will operate out of the National Library. One wing will be devoted to conferences on leadership and lessons learned from the example of George Washington. This is the Mount Vernon Ladies Association's next initiative to create the equivalent of a presidential library for our most deserving president. George Washington was our first national hero, our foremost founding father, and his leadership was once our nation's greatest resource. That leadership, which was both timely and timeless, and the character he exhibited should be celebrated and emulated as enduring hallmarks of conduct. His sterling example provides the opportunity to refresh and inspire our country as we face formidable challenges both home and abroad. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Henderson. I will now recognize myself for, for five minutes, but I guess what I would like to do is, is first of all, state that I am grateful for all of you all to be here. I, I would only hope that we could memorialize this hearing so that others at home, specifically those in, in school, would have a chance to, to view this. Um, and the reason I say that is, Mr. Brookheiser, I could listen to you for hours. I think that the, the American history is absolutely fascinating. As a child, uh, by the time I was 12 years old, my parents and grandparents had taken me to 48 of the continental states. 
My wife and I have taken our boys uh, to 49 of the, the, the 50 states, but along the way we have visited historic markers. We have visited museums. We have visited, you know, everywhere from, from, from Father Juniper Sierra's chapel in San Diego to uh, uh, Gettysburg to Williamsburg to, to everywhere. And I think that, that what you all speak of today is a symptom of a problem that we face today in our country. And that is a lack of understanding and appreciation for the, the foundation of this country and those founding fathers. And so my question to you is, besides recognizing the founder of our country's birthday on February 22nd, what else do we do? I mean, you know, civics is no longer taught. The, the, the apathy that permeates the youth today with regard to American history is, is almost appalling. So what is it that w else that we need to do to reinstill this, this, this in, invigorating passion uh, that, that our founders felt when they started this country? And Mr. Brookheiser, I'll start with you. Well, let me, uh, let me be a little hopeful. Um, we're falling very far short on education. Uh, Joe Ellis, who is a great historian of the founding period, uh, he's um, reaching the end of his uh, career as a college professor, and he told me uh, the last time I saw him that, that when he steps down, uh, he's not going to be replaced by another scholar of the American Revolution. He's going to be replaced by a scholar of looms. <laughs> and, you know, you can learn a lot from looms and the history of looms and the people who worked on looms, but you, you also have to know um, the, the basic structure of American history. Uh, I think there's a great appetite to know this. Uh, I, I give a lot of talks about, about Washington and other figures. Uh, very often people don't know a lot of the details, but they want to know. There's a great, I think, a positive feeling out there. I remember uh, when I was filming a documentary on Washington, and we filmed one episode in Newburgh, New York, which was uh, the last uh, encampment of the Continental Army at the end of the Revolution. And we did what's called Vox Pop, which is when you walk around the streets and you just get people's reactions to whatever it is you're, you're filming about. Uh, and there was, there was one, we grabbed one man, and I said, well, do you know... Uh, what this house, which is Washington's headquarters, it's preserved in downtown Newburgh, do, do you know what happened here? And he said, oh yes, that's where George Washington signed the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> now, Washington never signed the Declaration of Independence, and if he had, he wouldn't have signed it in that house. But this man, he knew there was a Washington connection, and, and he, he had a positive feeling about that. He had a positive feeling about Washington and that there was a connection between Washington and his town. So my attitude as a, as a historian is, I'll work with that. You know, just, just give me the willingness, you know, and then we can work on the details. But we can help this willingness uh, uh, by uh, making uh, Washington's birthday on his birthday, connecting it directly to him again. Uh, and we just have to make the effort in our own, you know, our own lives, whatever, whatever jobs we have. Thank you. Ms. Neal, would you like to add to that? Well, I think uh, that Richard pointed out what's only too true. If you look at the bestsellers, McCullough, all these historians, the American people are just craving this kind of historical uh, background. And I think it's a, an indictment, really, of our colleges and universities where history has become so dull, so boring, and often uh, so detached from really our founding era. So I think one thing that families can do, taxpayers can do, is they can start asking their colleges and universities and the trustees who run them why they don't insist on American history as a requirement. They can also go at the state level to ask why uh, increasingly at the K-12 level these state standards are de-emphasizing our founding period and great heroes like George Washington. Thank you. Ms. Henderson. Yes. Well, I can speak to, yeah. can speak to um, two of the things that Mount Vernon is, is doing to address uh, this problem. Um, we have at this point uh, placed eight million copies of the fifth grade biography lesson that was created uh, in conjunction with the Society of the Cincinnati into fifth grade schools in 50 states. We're very pleased about that. Um, it doesn't guarantee that the curriculum will be used in, in those schools, but we at least are offering it 
to, to the, the schools. The second thing we've done is um, we have started a portrait in the schools project. And um, this is uh, with Mount Vernon uh, underwriting the expense of this. We have placed 6,000 of the Rembrandt Peel portraits of George Washington in schools around the nation. And they're actually in all 50 states now. Wow. And all a school needs to do is write to Mount Vernon, indicate what prominent place they plan to put the portrait, and their UPS address. And wow, they have impressive. the portrait. So it also comes with a celebration kit and, uh, and a flag. And we hope that it will offer some teaching opportunities uh, in those schools that receive them. So those are two of the things we're doing. Um, we'll and I think anyone who's been out to Mount Vernon to see yeah. the education center and orientation center knows that we've you know, enlivened uh, the story of George Washington uh, for all of our visitors. Thank you. I see my time's expired. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I, uh, representing the congressional district, I do. And then, having been chairman of Fairfax County, where the most famous citizen of Fairfax County, of course, was George Washington. Um, I've I've had a long uh, and wonderful history with uh, Mount Vernon and uh, with Ms. Henderson and her colleagues at uh, who uh, run Mount Vernon. And uh, I had the privilege of. Uh, uh, helping uh, be present at the uh, opening uh, of uh, the distillery. Uh, George Washington has forgotten that after he retired from office, one of his principal cash sources of cash was actually running uh, one of the largest export distilleries in America. And by the way, his biggest customers overseas were the British. Uh, interestingly, um, and uh, and of course the grist mill and so forth. So I mean, it, it's it's a wonderful history and embedded in our culture in Fairfax County. Uh, it struck me, uh, Mr. Chairman, listening to Ms. Neal's testimony, um, I actually struck me and bothered me uh, that uh, so few universities and colleges, including in our native state of Virginia, actually require history as part of the curriculum. And 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 in other words, somebody could get a PhD and not take a single history class and know no more about Washington than that man in Newburgh. Uh, and that's, that's troubling, actually. Um, and um, I, I wonder, Congressman Wolf, whether you have a comment about that, because I, I, I'm sure that struck you as well, being another Virginian congressman, that even in our own university system, we're a little squishy about this requirement of knowing our history and knowing uh, the history of particularly George Washington. It does. In the passage of this bill, and again, there's no federal funding, and I appreciate the comments that the chairman made at the outset. And Mount Vernon, if you've been down there getting a million people a year, there's no federal funding. No one's coming. And so this is an opportunity to invigorate and go out to the universities and the high schools to ask them to teach courses based on American history. It would demonstrate that the United States Congress, both the House and the Senate, hopefully signed by the President, cares enough about this that it would enable us to kind of get another chance to go back and teach history the way that we should. So it isn't only to honor. I mean, I certainly want to honor George, George Washington. But it's also to take that opportunity to do what you've done, Mr. Chairman, for your kids so we can use this opportunity to do it for all the kids of America. The, the failure of this bill, not to put a great burden on the committee, the failure of this bill was that the Congress really doesn't care about this. We don't care. And the passage of it, and hopefully the President would sign it, and Mark Warner is the chairman, is the sponsor of the Senate, said would send another message, give us another opportunity to do what Mount Vernon does so very well, to all the children in our country and their parents. Thank you, Congressman Wolf. Um, Mr. Brookheiser, uh, one could argue that part of the problem here, too, is that we have so mythologized George Washington. Uh, and, as you point out, uh, commercialized him, too, while we're at it. But, I mean, even here in the Capitol, you know, in the, in the Dome, we, we have the apotheosis of George Washington, as if he's some Greek god ascending to Olympus. Uh, and um, he was a flesh and blood man who suffered and, you know, uh, had all of the normal attributes of a human being. Uh, and, actually, it's that actually makes him, I think, a heroic figure. He was an American Cincinnatus. You pointed out that he went home not once but twice. Our whole history was determined by his willingness voluntarily to step down from power and go back to Mount Vernon. 
And um, I just wonder if you might comment on that a little bit. And, and one other thing. Um, we look back on George Washington as President and some of the debates he had in his own cabinet. And uh, Congressman Wolf mentioned both Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson and that famous rivalry. But embedded in that rivalry were partisan politics, the, the growth of parties in America, which George Washington never liked and did not want to happen. Looking back on it, it almost looks quaint. And I wonder if you might just comment on that in terms of uh, our most famous founder and his views on party politics. Well, to, to take the second question first, uh, if Washington or his, any of his contemporaries came back and, and looked at our politics now, I'm sure they would all congratulate us. You've cleaned it up. You've made it less crazy. It's less partisan. It's less bitter. Really, if you want to read hair-raising stuff, you have to go back and read the polemics of the 1790s and right up through the War of 1812. Uh, they killed each other. You know, when Vice President Cheney shot that man, that was an accident, and he lived. But Alexander Hamilton was shot and killed by the sitting Vice President of the United States. And he was not the only signer of the Constitution who was killed in a duel. Richard Spate was another one. Uh, one signer of the Declaration was killed in a duel. Thomas Jefferson put a duelist who'd killed a man on the Supreme Court. That didn't come up in the confirmation hearing, you know? So politics, and, and that's because it was all new. You know, people didn't understand that if they lost, they'd, they'd get another chance in two years or four years or eight years. That's, that's what the laws said. But you actually had to do that and go through that for many cycles before people really accept that and internalize that. Um, the, the other thing about Washington is uh, he's relevant to the news. There are revolutions happening all over the world. And he was a revolutionary. Our revolution inaugurates an era of revolutions. I mean, the French Revolution is next, then the Haitian Revolution, and then on they go through Europe and all the revolutions in colonial countries, and they're still going on, the Arab Spring. So wouldn't it be interesting to look at this first revolution and see how did it work? Why did it work as well as it did? How did that happen? And Washington is a crucial part of that story. Ed, just to end by noting, since you're looking at the relevance to contemporary history, you know, somebody who consciously, I think, modeled himself after George Washington in terms of voluntarily stepping down when he could have had it forever was Nelson Mandela. And I, I think it, it had a very positive impact on South African pol political culture, hopefully will continue to do uh, moving forward. But George Washington was absolutely his model. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. The now recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I, I, I apologize for being late, and I, I know I missed a, a great testimony. I was dueling on the floor of the House, <laughs> verbally, verbally. Um, and uh, Congressman Wolf, thank you so much for introducing this concept, this legislation. Um, our history is a great history, and we miss too much of it. And uh, I think it's worth drawing, drawing insights from uh, great leaders in the past to uh, promote great leaders in the, in the present and future. Um, uh, Ms. Neal, I, I uh, read in your written testimony uh, the grim statistics which illustrate uh, historical illiteracy across our country uh, among even American college graduates. Um, to what extent has this changed over time, and has it been a gradual change, or is there a point of a significant incline, inflection at, at a period of time that's noticed? Well, I think that we've seen a gradual dissolution of the core curriculum for the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, it used to be that you could assume that students would graduate from colleges and universities with exposure to key areas of knowledge. But in fact, over the last 30 or 40 years, that's not happened. Instead, what we've seen is a vast proliferation of courses that students can now pick and choose from so that they can literally go through four, or five, often six years now, since the general graduation rate is now six years, without 
without taking any American history survey, without taking a literature survey. So we've seen a vast expansion, which I might add is also quite costly, uh, while we've uh, drawn away from ensuring that students are exposed to key areas that they will need. And I think it's interesting as you look at employers these days who are finding college graduates who cannot write, who cannot think, I think this is a byproduct of our colleges and universities failing to insist that students are exposed to what they need to know to be accomplished citizens and effective workers. So it's not just open book finals so when the teacher leaves the room in a remember my freshman American history class at Western Illinois University uh, that uh, frustrated me so much having studied the course and then watched that take place for those who didn't study, didn't remember, and simply wrote it down. Let, let me continue on. Your organization has uh, produced a number of studies, very powerful studies indicting uh, our educational institutions on the lacks thereof. What's been the response uh, uh, from those institutions? Well, you can imagine there are some that uh, when they get a poor grade uh, tend to look the other way. But I can tell you uh, in recent days, particularly in light of our Virginia report, uh, where schools have been shown to be failing to offer their students key uh, subjects, uh, there's a real concern. We're finding now that trustees are looking very closely at their curriculum. They're starting to ask questions of their provosts and their academic leaders as to why is it we are not insisting that our students have this experience. Exposure. So we're finding that it is helping to generate the very conversation that we want, which is to go back to the drawing board and to ask the question, what is it we want our graduates to know and be able to do? I think, quite frankly, uh, colleges and universities until the recent economic downturn have had so many resources that they've not really had to ask themselves this question. It's been education by adding machine. And so I think if there's any positive to the economic downturn, it gives the universities now an opportunity to look and see what they can do most effectively with limited resources. And of course, our goal is to ensure that they focus back on these key areas like American history. Oh, great. Keep, keep, keep at it. <laughs> keep pushing. Um, Ms. Henderson, um, having had the opportunity for the first time in a long time to uh, uh, show up at Mount Vernon, uh, it's, it's still a wonderful place and made better with some of the, the changes that you've initiated there. Um, I'm glad to, to have read in your testimony uh, the description of the new educational opportunities uh, that you're offering in Mount Vernon. Um, how would changing the observance of Washington's birthday to February 22nd be beneficial as you and Mount Vernon work to educate and enlighten the citizens of our country? We celebrate the birthday with uh, um, great enthusiasm at, at Mount Vernon. Um, and we all feel that um, the excitement that is there on the estate should be excitement that is felt throughout the entire country. And our feeling is that if we acknowledge our first president's birthday, it gives teachers in all the schools wonderful teaching opportunities um, to talk about um, the founding of our country and what it was about this extraordinary man. Um, it, um, I mean, it was, in the end, a successful experiment, but it was an experiment. And we're it's all... Still, it still is. <laughs> and we, we're all the beneficiaries. And I think that that, uh, if we can get those messages out, I think um, it begins to pull this nation together because there is there is a common appreciation for our roots. And I think there are many times in this nation when we face crises when turning to those common roots is a very good thing, very good thing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And I will recognize the distinguished gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for five minutes of questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And let me say that I am I'm, I'm pleased that we are having this discussion. For a long time, I have felt that um, our country has been moving away from some of the patriotic spirit that I think is necessary in order to provide us with a sense of not only historical significance, 
but just how far and how much change has occurred and how this country has evolved into the nation that it is, especially when you look at where it started. And uh, I, I I, I, I know that in many places we've established different kinds of holidays um, for any number of different uh, individuals who have contributed significantly. And I guess I understand the rationale, and I also understand the rationale for combining some days, especially if they're going to be recognized as holidays, but it seemed to me that we could recognize days and people without, uh, it could be a holiday, but it wouldn't necessarily have to be an off work <laughs> kind of holiday. And that if we built into, for example, curriculums in education institutions, especially at school, and I suspect that I'm biased in a sense because I grew up in rural America at a time when uh, individuals like myself didn't have many opportunities to read uh, certain kinds of information. I went to a one-room school <laughs> where Miss Beattie King <laughs> taught eight grades <laughs> plus the little primer and the big primer. And much of what we read, or many of the books that we had, were historical depictions or autobiographies or biographies of great people. And so we put a lot of emphasis on that. And from a personal vantage point, I think it was very helpful and very beneficial to me and, and has helped me see our country in a certain way. So, so I guess my, my question would be, how do we regain some of the patriotic spirit that I think we've actually lost? And, and I don't see an expression of it nearly as much. I mean, I see people performing the national anthem, for example, and that to me is kind of strange. Now we will have so and so preform the national anthem when I think of now we will all sing the national anthem as opposed to somebody singing it for us. So how how do we regain some of that? Anyone? Well, uh, one place to start, I think, is for uh, historians and uh, institutions like Mount Vernon uh, to, to recognize, and I think we do recognize it, but we have to convey the fact that these are great, exciting stories. I mean, the story of the American Revolution, uh, of how um, these colonies on the edge of the world took on the greatest superpower on Earth and beat it, uh, and then did not then fight among themselves, did not dissolve into chaos. I mean, that that is a thrilling story. Uh, there, there, it's, there's a lot of suffering involved in it, a lot of destruction, a lot of pain, uh, but there's also a lot of fortitude and a lot of achievement. And uh, people are hungry for it. That's why they make David McCullough a bestseller and Ron Chernow and, and, and so on and so on. They want to be told those stories, and we have to step forward and do it. Uh, thank you. The gentleman yields back. Our time has expired. I want to thank the uh, witnesses for taking time out of their busy schedule today uh, and enlightening us uh, uh, with, with your testimony. Uh, and with that, this uh, hearing stands adjourned. Thank you.